Good afternoon to one and all. I am Mrs. Sophia Angelin, Assistant Professor of Sri Abhirami College of Nursing, the moderator for today's international webinar series 4 on, ch on chances, challenges and changes, sharing experience of an advanced nurse practitioner. Before that, there is one announcement. I request the audience to uh, kindly mute your audio and videos and the viewers can post your queries in the chat box. Your doubt will be clear at the end of the session. First of all, I thank Lord Almighty for giving me a chance to be a moderator for the session. It is my privilege to welcome and thanks to our respected chairman, Dr. P. Periyasami Sir, Managing Director, Dr. Kundavi Devi Ma'am, and the Board of Directors for their constant, constant support and encouragement to organize the webinar series. I welcome our principal, Dr. Jansi Helena Ma'am, Chairperson, Vice Principal, Dr. Irene Mercy Ma'am, Secretary for this webinar. I extend my warm welcome to all of the faculty members, students, and viewers who are watching webinar through the YouTube. Healthcare plays a vital role in our day-to-day -day life. Health industry has to be always dynamic with medical break through every day to stay ahead, not only in the advanced technologies, but also in education, training, performance, and monitoring. The most important concept is the nurse to analyze the chances, to accept the changes, and face the challenges. The environment for the nurses should be safe, endowing, and sustained to improve the healthcare for all. To unfold the truths and reveal the facts on chances, challenges, and changes, we have with the special resource speaker, Madam Finelo Macline. I welcome you, ma'am, to the series. I request our principal, Dr. Jansi Helena, ma'am, to introduce the speaker for this webinar session. Thank you, Sophia. Good morning, one and all gathered here. I really thank God Almighty for this wonderful day. Also, I would like to thank our management for the enormous untiring support for conducting this webinar series. I welcome you all the participants who are joined for this day. See, it's my immense pleasure to invite and introduce the highly competent, competent and enthusiastic um, person, Madam Finula McLean. Madam Finula McLean, she has completed her BSc Psychology in Ireland and then she continued her studies in general and mental health nursing in London. She worked as um, as a, as a nurse in the behavioral therapy ward. And then she's got trained in behavioral psychotherapy at University College London. From 1991 onwards, she worked in the same field. She's completed her master's in cognitive behavioral therapy and worked as a clinical nurse specialist in the same area. Now she's working as an advanced nurse practitioner in cognitive behavioral therapy in Dublin. So, Madam, I'm very happy to have you here uh, in this webinar series. I'm handing over session to you. Please take over. Well, thank you very much for your welcome. I'm delighted to be here and I'm very happy to have been asked to contribute. Um, I'll start with, I'll, I'll start the slideshow and um, hopefully you'll all be able to see it. Um, I'll just add to I'll just add to the um, the introduction that part of working as an advanced nurse practitioner is that I also work in Trinity College in Dublin, the um, leading university here in Ireland. Now, I think you can see that. Yes, you can see the story? I can yes. see. Okay. So th this is just to say that, yes, um, chance, challenge and change, advanced nurse practice in mental health. Um, this is a, a fairly recent role that came in during my life as a nurse here in Ireland. So just a little bit about um, the background. So 
the first nurse trained in CBT at that time um, was um, Charlie McHugh in 1975. He trained in London. There's always been a fair bit of toing and froing between um, Britain and Ireland. So um, he went off in 1975, but was employed as a staff nurse and um, stayed pretty much a staff nurse for most of his career. He's well retired now even though he was highly specialised in his work. So what brought about the change? Well, one is that nurse education moved to universities instead of being hospital-based from 1997. And CBT courses, instead of being hospital-based, also transferred to universities. Um, in 1999, every nurse in Ireland went on strike. And we strike for better pay, we strike for better conditions, and we also struck so that the profession would be better regarded if we can keep moving forward and acknowledge the education, knowledge and expertise of nurses. So as a result, the new nursing grades, new clinical nursing grades were brought in of clinical nurse specialist and advanced nurse practitioner. Um, just to say a little bit about the, the CBT training in particular, and this will go for any other specialty really that people uh, train in. So uh, the European Association for Behavioural and Cognitive Therapies, which I was involved in as the Irish representative to the European Association, drew up um, a, a regulation for what actually should be the basics of training necessary in all countries across Europe in order to be accredited. So following on from that, the university courses in Ireland as well made sure that they would adhere to the European regulations, which would make the, the training transferable across all countries in Europe. The big difference is that in most of Europe, the training is restricted to um, psychologists and psychiatrists. It's only in Britain, Ireland, Iceland and Japan at the moment that nurses are trained as specialists in CBT in order to carry out therapy with the, the patients that we come across. So with a postgraduate diploma, which you can do in one year in Trinity or two years in other universities, that's a basic qualification in CBT, and that's sufficient for clinical nurse specialists. Um, as clinical nurse specialists grow and develop and do further education and so forth, then they may do a master's, which entitles them then to become an advanced nurse practitioner. So... The roles are, as I said, are fairly new in Ireland. They've only been here about 20, 22 years now. And what is a clinical nurse specialist? What is an advanced nurse practitioner? Oops. So the core concepts of a clinical nurse specialist is clinical focus. So they're one-to-one -one working with patients. They work with patients individually. They work with patient groups. They're an advocate in the multidisciplinary team for the, the clients. And they provide training and education to other nurses so that they have a basic understanding of how CBT works. And they're involved in audit. And very basic kinds of research. They'd help out with research and they're a consultant. CBT is one of the specialties in which nurses are educated and we know more than the psychiatrists about this particular specialty. It means that we are generally very well regarded in the, the multidisciplinary team. The advanced nurse practitioner has some other core concepts autonomy in clinical practice, which is really important. We are responsible and accountable for the work we do. We're the ones who decide what we do. We often work in collaboration <clears throat> with um, 
a clinical nurse specialist in devising policies and procedures and so on. We're recognized as having expert practice. Our expert practice or knowledge, experience, um, research provide us with the tools for professional leadership for the profession as a whole, nursing as a whole, as well as clinical leadership, so that we're leaders in the clinical field as well as in the wider uh, field. So we have more responsibilities in terms of, oh, I don't know, be, being on national committees, forging national policies, all that kind of thing. And we are in, we have an Irish Association for Advanced Nurse Practitioners, where all the advanced nurse practitioners from general and um, intellectual um, disability, for children, for adults, all come together and have a national conference once a year. And we're, we're expected to carry out research, which is one of the reasons we're heavily liaising with the university departments. Um, it, ideally, we should have a joint appointment to the university as well as to the health service. That hasn't actually come about, but we work very closely with the universities. And in fact, I work two and a half days in the, the clinical field and the rest of the time is divided up between working in Trinity and private practice. So it makes a huge difference to be working with people who are research orientated in the universities so that we can devise. It's, it's very, very hard to do research on your own. It's really important to have those um, links with the universities in order to be able to forge research. So the education level, as I said, for the clinical nurse specialist is higher diploma, whereas an advanced nurse practitioner must have a master's degree in the specialist field. The amount of experience needed is five years post-registration experience for in nursing, including a minimum of two years in the specialist area and then the higher diploma as well for the clinical nurse specialist and there's more experience and knowledge required for the advanced nurse practitioner. In terms of competencies, uh, the clinical nurse specialist is at specialist level, the ability to practice safely and fulfilling the professional responsibility within her scope of practice, whereas the advanced nurse and therefore the, the competence to exercise higher levels of judgment, discretion and decision making. But they're very, um, we can't, we can't, we work together. It's impossible to, to do this again as a one off stand because you're working together with your clinical nurse specialists, you're collecting data with the clinical nurse specialists, you're looking at how services can be improved, what's necessary and so on. It's a, it's a really exciting kind of work for nurses. In terms of cl clinical decision making, the CNS assesses, plans, delivers and evaluates care within the agreed dis interdisciplinary protocols, um, that is with the entire team, whereas the advanced nurse practitioner can do so autonomously as recognition in her expertise. In terms of the research, the it, the CNS does it at a lower level, participating in, in um, nursing research and audit, whereas the a ANP leads research, coordinates and carries out nursing audit and research, generally with the help of the CNS as she's working with. Leadership, again, <clears throat> leadership for a CNS is more local. It's leadership in clinical practice, acts as a consultant in inter and intra disciplinary con uh, consultations. The advanced nurse practitioner, the ANP, um, develops a vision of nursing practice, which can be developed beyond the current scope so that your expertise and your knowledge is acknowledged and contributes to professional and health policy at local, regional and national level, which is really quite exciting to be part of um, a, a, a development of going forward and improving um, the health services.
<clears throat> we were quite a lot behind here when I moved back to Ireland from um, Britain. Of course, when I was working in London, I was working in um, units that were really quite advanced, probably more advanced than elsewhere in Britain. So when I came back to Ireland, I felt I had gone back about 20 years and although I was, I've been working at the CNS role for a long, long time, I was actually employed as a staff nurse until 2000 when the clinical nurse specialist um, role was developed. Again, in education and training, the CNS facilitates staff development in formal and informal ways and provides education to clients. The ANP provides mentorship, preceptorship, teaching, facilitation, and professional supervisory skills for nurses and other healthcare professionals. In fact, as my career has developed, um, the supervision of developing um, the CNSs, of developing um, community nurses, of developing uh, nursing skills in CBT has become more and more part of my job because my clinical years will be coming to an end. And so it's really important that the existing staff get the benefit of my education and experience and so on. Um, <clears throat> I just thought I, I would show a photo. This is um, Mary Cutty Augustine, who worked with me for many, many years as um, a CNS, a clinical nurse specialist, um, unfortunately now retired and back in Bangalore. Um, I miss her a lot. She was excellent. It's wonderful to it, generally what you find with these kind of specialist jobs is the nurses who go want to go into specialisms are very dedicated. They are so interested in what they do. They're so eager to do what they do that they really are a joy to work with. I know I'm, I'm talking mostly about the um, CBT, which is my own area of practice, but there's many, many other um, specialties, as you can see here in general nursing, chronic disease management, diabetes, oncology, heart failure, um, quite a few working in the emergency departments. Um, there's midwives, and in fact, we have midwives trained in CBT as well who deal with um, postnatal depression and such like um, disorders. And here in, in mental health, we also have a specialist group of all um nurses working in um, uh, mental health, ANPs working in mental health as a subgroup of the overall general nurses. Uh, obviously, we're a much smaller number, mental health being much smaller generally than um, general health. And it, that's been really useful because that kind of cross fertilization is really important where you find out what people are doing in their areas and you go, oh, that's a really good idea. I wonder, would it work out in our area? So that it's really, really important to have these kind of links with each other. And the informal links are just as important as the formal links. So hopefully, once this pandemic dies down, if it ever does, we'll be able to meet in person. We're hoping to have a meeting of all the mental health nurse ANPs in May. It's um, one of the advantages of living in a small country is that it's quite easy to meet up in person and meet people from other areas and, and um, places because, you know, we are a small country. There's five million people living in the Republic of Ireland. And um, again, nurses do tend to know each other quite a lot. But having those groups is really good. Um, the utility of... Um, ANPs and CNSs has been heavily, heavily studied um, because they want to know, they are, are we actually adding value to our services? Are we worth the money we're paid? Um, and I think nurses are always very reticent. They tend to hold back a bit. They don't like boasting. But it's really important that it's shown just how useful we are to the health service. 
So the, the, there's been research on these two areas, as I'm saying here, the case management and also the service um, provision were really well studied. So on the case management side, um, the specialist nurses were seen as very thorough by doctors. The specialists knew the, the patients very well, had good relationships with them and used the res services resources very well. So we weren't referring people <clears throat> to all sorts of ancillary service in the hopes that something would work. We knew what would probably work. We put people to in touch with those resources. And it meant that people were treated successfully or referred on appropriately and quickly, reducing hospitalization, which, of course, is um, expensive and reducing unnecessary tests. And communication skills are really important in nursing. As we know, working with patients, communication skills, not just with the patients, but also with the other staff, we tend to be quite good at getting on with people. So liaising with nurses, with other with other members of the multidisciplinary team, dietitians, psychologists, psychiatrists, and so on, um, is really really useful. It showed that when there when specialist nurses weren't present the whole process of case management was slower. There was a lot more inappropriate uh, referrals and care is more fragmented and less holistic. Um, Non-specialist nurses tend to, ref tend to suggest referrals to the doctor rather than making the referrals themselves. So now what happens is that referrals are discussed with the team and then made by the nurse. There's a, a huge difference in terms of readmission rates. So patients don't get readmitted as quickly. Um, collaborative collaborative decision-making that everyone is happy with um, increased. Continuity of care, really, really important for patients because they hate being seen by a new person every time. The continuity of care was implemented much better. So the patient always knew there was one person they could ring to get the answers that they needed. Um, and the continuity of care also means that there was a, a large drop in the number of patients who didn't attend. When there wasn't a, a specialist nurse, um, the DNAs did not attend, could be up to 30% for appointments. But one one clinical nurse specialist recorded her DNA rates as two to three percent. So that's a huge drop. More and more people were actually attending their appointments. In terms of um, service provision, specialist nurses developed good relationships with patients. They had more time than the doctors did. So they were able to spend more time listening to their concerns. And this was really, really valued by the patients. Nobody likes to be fobbed off. Nobody likes ha seeing someone who, who's trying to rush through seeing patients. The, the other thing that was made, made a difference was the patient was much more, more involved and sometimes the carer, if necessary, they were involved in decision making. So they were given the knowledge necessary to make them make decisions. They encouraged self-care self and they set up self-care help groups. And um, the um, service users in receipt of health promotion advice reported improved health and um, improved health and reduced attendance at health care centres. So they were less likely to go to GPs because they were looking after themselves. Um, I don't know if this is going to work. This is a, a nurse working in A&E in my local general hospital here. 
No. My name is Sally Mol. I'm one of the critical care ANPs in ICU St. James's. And I say St. James's ICU is a great place to work. Uh, first of all, we are so patient-oriented, patient-centered. And it's all about giving quality and safe care to the patients um, admitted to the critical care. From a staffing perspective, we have got a multicultural team in our ICU, especially in the nursing team. We have uh, staff from more than 10 countries, I suppose, which is a good atmosphere to work with. And there are opportunities for, you know, like for education and development. I am, I'm working in St. James I see for the last 17 years. I started here as a staff nurse and now I have progressed and to an advanced nurse practitioner. Lots of opportunities for education and development and going up the ladder, you know, you, you have a great opportunity and it is a great place to work. Um, in terms of a CBT specialist nurses, um, because we were one of the early specialties in um, uh, in psychiatry and mental health, and we were apparently taking over the jobs of what had hitherto been regarded as psychologist and psychiatrist jobs, and they weren't too sure were nurses able to do this. There being a bit of a paternalistic approach to nursing and um, regarding nurses as um, maybe not as competent or as intelligent as doctors or psychiatrists. We were certainly cheaper than doctors or, and psychologists. So there was a lot of um, research done to find out how effective nurses were in specialist roles. And this goes back to the 1970s. <clears throat> so I'm saying here you can see that um, the most extensively studied are the behavioral psychotherapy nurses who trained in the Maudsley in London in the 1970s. And there was quite a few Irish nurses went to study there. Um, they found that the nurses treated clients as successfully as, if not better than, psychiatrists and psychologists. At that time, the, the number of um, disorders and conditions that they treated were quite a bit more limited than what we work with now, but also slightly different. So the list here is agoraphobia, social phobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, self-mutilation or self-harm, as we would call it nowadays, trichotillomania, which is um, obsessive hair pulling, stammering, personality disorders, sexual problems and hysterical conversion disorders. And, you know, they, all the findings were all saying that the nurses were really worthwhile having. Um, I, I think a lot of them went to went on placements to hospitals. <clears throat> that realizing how 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 useful they were, wanted them to stay rather than go back to the hospitals that they had come from. Um, in two in the year two thousand, you can see Gournay said two hundred and thirty one nurse therapists were registered in the UK. Um, I would say it's a lot more now. Um, the the conferences that we have, either the British and Irish conferences we we work together, um, would have an attendance of maybe oh six thousand. The European one about the same. Um, so again, OCD, depression, agoraphobia, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic, social phobia, simple phobias, somatoform disorders. Um, and the amount of people having qualifications obviously has increased as the number of courses has increased. When I originally did my training in London uh, with the postgrad diploma, um, there were no master's um, courses in CBT. They came along only after I'd been in practice for quite a number of years. Um, <clears throat> I would also say that in terms of funding, the health service tends to be really good about training nurses and paying for the, the training of nurses because of the benefits that have been found in having nurse specialists. <clears throat> um, 
again, this is going back to before the nurse specialists were actually working as such before the grade existed. So generally they were working as whatever grade they were given, staff nurse, uh, manager, nurse, clinical nurse, manager. Um, <clears throat> but uh, people stayed in the job was one of the main things. Um this was a survey done, well, actually, I did it, <laughs> of the graduates of, uh, of the, the PG DIP, um, and 46% of them were nurses. So uh, the other people who undertake the CBT course alongside the nurses are psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, counsellors, occupational therapists, dietitians, speech and language therapists, and ac academic psychologists. So you get quite a, a nice mix in each class that comes along. So half of which or more than half will always be nurses, but you'll get the other professions coming along for exactly the same training. And it also means that as the other professions train in it, they also have more respect for the nurses who are specialists because they know exactly what kind of training they've been through. So eight were clinical nurse specialists before they started the course. Uh, 14 were clinical nurse specialists after completing the course. 10 were staff nurses, but only three were staff nurses um, after completing the course. <clears throat> so professionally, it, it's a really good job to get into. If you love the clinical field, you can be promoted within the clinical field with a, qual a specialist qualification. Um, what percentage of your time, this is a continuation of that study, is spent on the following activities? So the vast majority is spent on direct client contact with much smaller amounts of time um, going for management, administration, um, supervision of others, teaching and research. Um, so the client contact is the main focus of the job with the others taking less time. When we asked people who said that CBT wasn't the main focus, the reasons were given lack of resources and funding, lack of time, other duties taking precedent and the non-therapeutic role. So sometimes people were back in their old jobs and told to, to use part of their time to do CBT. So they might have been um, community psychiatric nurses, community mental health nurses who were then doing part-time CBT. So support of management is absolutely necessary when you're working in, in a specialist role. And you can see there for two respondents, supervision it comprised 40 to 60% of their work time. And as I said, it's getting to be like that for me because the, you know, as I'm coming out of my job, uh, as I will be retiring in the next couple of years, it's more important to do more teaching, more clinical supervision. So you're talking to people about their patients, about their work, about their research, more of the time rather than direct client contact. So it's easier to study ANPs, actually, because we have a separate register on the um, nurses board. So I'm actually a registered advanced nurse practitioner, as well as a registered mental health nurse, registered general nurse and so on. So it's much easier to track down advanced nurse practitioners than, um, than the CNSs. So... The CNS is largely clinical and expected to teach others and conduct audit. The clinical aspect of the ANP role is autonomy and expert practice, which is understood by everybody. The leadership and research aspects are not really well understood or supported within the health service 
or at the time, I this is a few years ago since I did this research. I hope things have improved since. Um, and that's because, of course, the health service is focused on clinical work and don't see the utility of research as well, whereas the universities are, are focused on research and they know the utility of research to actual practice. So... It, it, 2016, there was 13 ANPs in mental health, 2019, 25. So there's an ever-increasing number. In fact, the, the, um, the aim is to have 2% of all nurses be advanced nurse practitioners. Um, I did a survey to find out where all the clinical nurse specialists were. Um, quite difficult to get information. Um, you're reliant on the different areas having uh, records of all these things. And then there was part-time ones, a, a CNS in another area. So a CNS who's actually a community mental health nurse with CBT qualifications, but her specialist is, is her specialism is um, mental health in, in the community rather than CBT. So, um, <clears throat> key leadership activities guide and coordinate the activity of the the mental uh, the multidisciplinary team, which is unusual for nurses. The psychiatrist is nearly always seen as the leader. Um, <clears throat> so, guide and coordinate the activities changes initiates and changes care patient care through practice development takes responsibility for policy and guideline development and implementation introduces and develops patient care services in fact there's a really good um example of this in one of my one of the areas neighboring my the only my the area i work in where um an anp candidate in south dublin has introduced a, a team approach to working with people as early as possible. So before they even get into tertiary care, they're working with them to prevent people developing disorders to the state where they really need tertiary care in the hospital. So they're doing a lot of preventative work, which has really reduced the amount of people that require psychiatrist input at the hospital level. It's a, their, fi their figures are actually amazing. She hasn't published them yet, but she will do. So and developing policy at national and international level. Um, <clears throat> again, it's really important to have uh, contacts with people all around the country and abroad because you get more ideas, you get more a sense of how things can develop, what's best practice and so on. It also means that you need to be a kind of assertive person or develop assertive um, qualities within yourself because there are obstacles to all of this. And uh, the, main, uh, um, the main is the, the lack of opportunity. It's also because of your clinical caseload. We all have a heavy clinical caseload. We all love working with clients, but we have to make time for the other aspects of our job, which sometimes can be difficult when there's long waiting lists. In, in my area, my waiting list is, I think, um, four months at the moment for me to see a new client. But that's because um, I'm the only uh, CBT therapist. I don't actually have any CNSs at the moment. The survey I did um, some years ago, do you feel your role is understood? And the problem is, while we're very appreciated by the medical staff and the other members of the multidisciplinary team, it's often the nurse management who is not too sure what it is. Um, do you feel enabled to fulfil your role description in clinical practice? Certainly. Um, leadership, mostly. Time for research and audit, maybe. Expert practice somewhat. Uh, another initiative we had set up was um, 
uh, with RK, who I believe is speaking later, it was a nurse um, research group, which was hugely useful um, in, in terms of uh, getting ideas, developing projects, having help with, for example, someone who'd know more about statistics than you did. Um, uh, getting funding for these things. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just skip over some of these things. Um, again, the the ANPs, the Advanced Nurse Practitioners, I feel very satisfied. I, joint appointments with universities came up quite a bit. Um, the experience of the research group again the largest thing stimulating and motivational the next one was educational you're learning from people who know things that have expertise in areas that you maybe don't and they massively increase job satisfaction so more changes coming um we're all going to be registered on a new board. Um, we're all registered with the nursing board at the moment, but we will need a second registration for um, counselling and psychotherapy. And that's being developed at the moment. Um, there's also a new health service coming along for a universal single tier health and social care system at the moment, we have a public health service and there's also a private health service. So that will be interesting. So there's questions for the future. Um, will we be obliged to maintain, maintain two statutory reg registrations? Um, there should be 700. The pandemic obviously has slowed this down somewhat, um, which, as I said, was 2% of the nursing population. And because there are courses, a generic course for an ANP, will we need to have two master's levels courses, one as an ANP and the other in the actual specialism, whatever it is, CBT um, or cardiology or whatever it is. So what have we learned? We're hugely beneficial. We've had great success in improving the service to the um the patients and clients. We've made systems more effective. The nurses tend to be dedicated and self-motivated um, and get enormous job satisfaction. What do we need to do? We need to continue the role of education to nursing management because most of them haven't worked with um, CNSs or CBs or um, ANPs for a very long time. <clears throat> we do have a very multicultural um, service with 49%, almost half of new um, registrants in Ireland were from outside the EU, uh, <clears throat> which, which um, serves a very diverse population now because we also have a high level of immigration, also in, a newish thing in Ireland. And... Um, I've provided some video links and newspaper articles and references and so on, should anyone like to do it. But that is the end of my uh, presentation. And if there are any questions, I don't know if we time for questions. Thank you, ma'am, for enlightening uh, us as with the challenges and changes in nursing, ad advanced nursing practice in the nursing profession, ma'am. Uh, it is a time to clear the doubts of the viewers. So viewers can post, uh, post your questions in the chat box. We are waiting for your questions. Good afternoon. Is there one question? Uh, first of all, I thank you very much for your good presentation, Riyari. It's so useful. And we are by your um, speech, ma'am, Riyari. We are very uh, thankful to you. And there is one question is there. Uh, so what are the challenges can face it by the clinical nurse practitioner as well as the advanced nurse practitioner in day-to-day -day, uh, 
a life of delivery of care or the quality of nursing care ma'am what are the challenges can be faced by clinical nurse practitioner as well as the advanced nurse practitioner ma'am can you please well the the main challenge i think is the clinical load because there there really aren't enough of us yet and um, when when we get to a sufficient number that we can share the workload more it will be a, it, it will make life easier at the moment the the um, clinical load can be so much that the other aspects of the job tend to be neglected you know the the research the audit the teaching and education and i think it's it's vitally important for ourselves as well much as we love working with clients is to remember the other aspects of the job are just as important it's really important to be training other people it's really important to be bringing the specialist to to a wider audience and encouraging other nurses to take up the specialisms and um, because as i said the working load is is quite high and my own waiting list as i said is four months i hate having people on a waiting list i think people need to have care given to them at the point they require it not to be waiting four months in order to get that care but i'm only one person i can't clone myself and the temptation then is to spend all my my time on clinical work and neglect the other aspects which is one of the reasons i'm very glad that i i work with trinity because that forces me to spend some time on teaching and research where i'm then missing the part of my job that i'm then missing is the policy making and for that i need more nursing management support but that means i have to encourage management to give me that support that they know what i need yeah the biggest challenge is that yes you're a clinical nurse specialist you do this because you love the job you love working with clients but it can be overwhelming at times thank you thank you so much ma'am any other questions from the viewers and there is one question again uh, there is one question again and as you said then uh, there is a difference between the clinical nurse uh, specialist as well as the advanced nurse practitioner uh, and you are stating that in the autonomy in practice in advanced nurse practitioner so my question is whether the clinical nurse specialist can take the decision regarding the quality and on the care of patient in case of emergency as you said they are only the advanced nurse practitioner can take a uh, decision or uh, the autonomy in the practice or autonomy in the take of the decision but in case of clinical nurse uh, specialist can take the decision in case of emergency situation ma'am please well i i think if it's necessary you can it's within your scope of practice it's with it's it's within your knowledge and expertise absolutely i think okay. if you can justify your decisions certainly okay thank you thank you any other questions i might think no more questions ma'am shall we wind up now yes of course we can thank you ma'am for clearing the doubts now we have come to the end of this webinar session i thank you the viewers for your participation in this webinar and thank you so much ma'am and thank you one and all thank you very much bye bye now thank you ma'am bye bye thank you so much ma'am for the wonderful presentation god bless thank you bye bye